Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. I want to begin with this study with one word, globalism. We are living in a world that is becoming a global community. Now, there's many aspects to this. One is we're seeing what happens in one country also taking place in another. There's many different applications. There's many different implications to this. But when we look at this from a spiritual standpoint, one conclusion that we see is this. How believers are responding to what's going on around them is similar regardless of their location. Whether they be in Africa or Europe, whether they be in Asia or the West, we see great similarity in the house of God. And the problem with that is those things that are similar those things which are common, for the most part, are not pleasing to God. And what do I mean by this? Well, very simply, we see that in the last days, and the Word of God confirms this, that there's going to be a scoffing at the promises of God. Instead of taking seriously prophetic truth, what is going to happen among God's people? There's going to be a movement to those individuals that, that speak not sound doctrine, but those who speak and teach in a way that the Bible says tickles the ear. Now, what does that mean, to tickle the ear? It is an idiom that refers to those individuals who will be speaking in a way that meets the expectations, the desires of the masses. They will not be speaking in a way that is pleasing to God. They will not be servants of the living God, but they will speak, they will teach what the people want to hear in order to give them pleasure to gratify them where they are and how they are behaving. But when I look at the Word of God, I see that the Word of God brings about change. The more I study God's Word, the more I understand my need and urgent need to change, to be different, to be one who is conformed to the instructions of God. In other words, when one studies Scripture, it produces repentance in his or her life. But today, that call of repentance, those speaking of the standards of God, such speaking, teaching, preaching is very rare. No matter where you are, on the globe. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 28. Now, hopefully, you will remember that we began this chapter in our previous lesson. And we saw that God is not pleased with Ephraim, that is, that northern kingdom. There's many reasons for that, but primarily, we see in the kingdom of Israel, that northern kingdom, a great problem with idolatry. And I have shared over and over the connection between idolatry and simply acting 
in a selfish way, pursuing your own desires rather than the instructions of God, rather than the purposes of God. I've shared with you as well the connection between the concept of holiness and the purpose, the will, the plans of God. If we are not being conformed to the purposes of God, we are not going to be demonstrating holiness, and therefore we will not have a testimony that is effective, a testimony that is pleasing to God. So when we looked at that first half of chapter 28, God is not pleased with his people. And I can say with great confidence that when God looks at his people today, those who say, I'm a follower of the Lord's Messiah, I can say with with great confidence, he is not pleased with the vast majority of those who believe they, they belong to him. There is a great disconnect from the people of God to the truth of God. And that is going to bring judgment upon this world, judgment upon the believing community. And that judgment, it is going to be used by God in order to test individuals, not for the purpose of God knowing, but to teach us whether we really are individuals who are disciples of Messiah Yeshua or not. Do we understand the covenantal responsibilities that we have? Because I believe that many individuals who might say one day, yes, I'm a believer, but when they learn what happens to true believers, what they're called to do, what they will suffer for their faith, I believe many will say, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I thought I was getting involved in. And the scripture that I go back to over and over from John's first epistle, when he says, they went out from us, and it speaks about a large departure from the people of God. And John says they went out from us, meaning they left the faith because they were never, and I want to emphasize that, they were never of us. They were never truly believers. They were never really saved. Now, we're going to begin in in verse 17, and we're going to see something that's very important. Actually, verse 16. And in verse 16, God is going to do something that is going to bring great change. It concerns Messiah, and it concerns him being set in position. Now, let's make this personal for a moment before we open up the text. And to learn that God, if we're a believer, God has placed his spirit within us. Messiah rules our heart. And therefore, because of his presence in our life, there's going to be differences. We are going to be changed, transformed. We are going to be conformed to the will of God. That is if he rules in my life. So what we're seeing in verse 16, is Messiah being established in this world? And his presence in this world in the last days, in a kingdom coming manner is going to bring about great change. And the message for us is when we look at this and see the changes that his presence in this world brings about, we should learn that his presence in our life should bring about similar change, similar transformation. So let's begin. Isaiah 28 and verse 16. It is because of how far the people of Judah are from the will of God that God acts. And again, 
There is no question that this is a last day prophecy. It is dealing with how far the people have strayed away from God in the days of Isaiah. But what we need to learn, what we need to realize is that same distance from God, the same perversion of his word, the same spirit of false prophecy that took place nearly 3,000 years ago is going to also be very prevalent in the last days. Verse 16, therefore, meaning because of that spiritual condition, because of the behavior of the people of God. Therefore, thus said the Lord God. Now, that expression, the Lord God, yes, it appears in many places in the scripture, but it is not all that frequent. And many of the rabbinical scholars point out, when that phrase appears there, the Lord God in this construction, It speaks about a unique occurrence, something that is happening that is not not frequent, but something that is rare and highly significant. And the significance is going to be seen in the outcome of what God is doing. So once more, verse 16. Therefore, thus said, it's in the past tense, It relates to a future event, but the past is used to show that what he's promising here is assured. It's going to happen. So therefore, thus says the Lord God, Hineni. Now, Hineni is is comprised of two words. The word Hine, which is behold, and the word Ani, which is I. So behold, God is saying, I am acting. I am moving. I am doing something. And we see normally this word used in regard to the patriarchs. Them responding to the call of God to carry out the will of God. And in this case, it is God moving himself to carry out his plan, his purposes, to establish his will. We read, behold, I, God wants us to focus upon him because he is laying, it is being laid in Zion, that is Zion. And I've mentioned that the term Zion is a kingdom word. So whenever that word appears in the scripture, it gives that passage a kingdom context. So behold, God is speaking. He wants our attention and is laid in Zion, a oven. Now, this is a stone. Normally, the word is evan, but in this context and this construction, it's oven. And it speaks about Messiah. No one who interprets the scripture sees this applying to anyone else. Now, Judaism disagrees, obviously, with who this Messiah is, but it's clearly, (coughs) excuse me, this passage is clearly speaking about Messiah. And we know it's Messiah Yeshua. Behold, I am. I am establishing, laying in Zion a stone. Now, this word for laying has to do with laying specifically a foundation. So, Messiah is the foundation of the kingdom of Zion. And then we have Evan, back to the normal enunciation of this word, Evan Bochan. Now, some will will translate this a tried stone, but it's really in the presence, and it means this stone is is testing it's not that this stone has been tested and found faithful he has been he is but the emphasis here is that this stone is going to be used 
things are going to be compared to him and based upon the, the outcome, this comparison, what it reveals, there's going to be action. And this action is going to be highly significant and very powerful. It is going to bring about a change in this world and among the true people of God. So it's a, a testing stone, a cornerstone, a precious cornerstone. And then we have the word musad, musad. Now, the word yesod is foundation. And this speaks of a foundation which has already been laid. And the word appears twice, so most translation. See it being properly understood as a sure foundation. So Messiah, he has been laid in Zion as a foundation. He is this, this testing stone that he's going to test things. He is that pressure, precious cornerstone, meaning that he's going to hold things together and he's going to bring about, as it says here, Musad, Musad, a sure foundation. And then notice something. Now here again, this is not New Testament. This is from the Hebrew Bible. And we read, Ha Ma'amin Lo Yachish, which means the one who believes. Believes in the context is, is in him. One who has faith in him believes in him. Such a one will not be, and the word here means to make haste. He is not going to be easily moved. Now, this is the same word that, that can derive fear or concern. This one because of what Messiah is and what he's going to do to bring about this one has no concern when this happens he has confidence because he wants the change that messiah brings about and this is a a interesting point because we need to ask ourselves do we want the change that messiah is going to bring about are we in submissiveness, in agreement to his objectives? Or do we see him bringing about one thing and us trying to achieve something else? There's been a lot of talk recent about prophets. Now, I believe that, that God, he is able, he can give prophetic truth to whomever he wants. But that prophetic truth that people potentially could receive today, it is always, always going to be supported by the word of God. And since we have the complete revelation of God and there is no other scriptural revelation from God, this is it. The word of God is complete. So any type of prophetic word today, is going to be simply pointing us to Scripture and, and guiding us to a, a particular verse or passage that has great relevance for a particular situation, the time that we're in, what's going on around us. People have asked me, there's a, a new group of prophets self-proclaimed prophets. Do I believe that, that some of them are truly prophets? And my response is, no, I do not. I believe the vast, vast, vast majority of these individuals, and if they call themselves a prophet, I am convinced that they are a liar. They have not heard from God. They are not someone that God is using. So, so be very clear. If you want to know where I stand against or where I stand in regard to this modern move of prophets, I am utterly, completely opposed to it. I strongly believe that these individuals that call themselves prophets are 
deceivers. And that's why, and the scripture says, in the last days, there's going to rise up many false prophets. Well, where are they? Primarily in Christianity. They are false teachers and they, they call themselves, they use that title, prophets. My advice to you, anyone who says, I'm a prophet, I would run from. I would give them no credence whatsoever. So I hope my position is clear in regard to that issue. Verse 17. The primary outcome of Messiah's return, him being set, being the foundation of the kingdom of God, notice what it says. I will set judgment as a line. Now, we have seen in this chapter this word kav, a measuring line or a surveying line that goes forth in order to build properly. And what it's saying here is that if we want the kingdom to be built up properly, that measuring line, that surveying line that goes out, it has to be based in, what's the word? Mishpat, justice. And also righteousness will be the plumb line. And the plumb line makes sure that something is, is centered. So we have two different words, the surveying line and the plumb line. All of this was necessary to build properly, to bring an order to one's construction. And that's what Messiah is. He is that measuring stone, that testing stone. It is according to him. His nature, his attributes, his character, that his kingdom is going to be built and established and function. That's simply what Isaiah is revealing in this passage. And because of that, notice what's going to happen. Second part of verse 17. Veya a brad machse chazav, which means and hail. Now, we have seen both in the past and in the future prophetically, God is going to use hail in order to bring a change, to destroy, to clean up, to destroy and clean up that which is not pleasing to him. And here, the destruction that hail is going to bring about, he is going to destroy the, the refuge that is built on lies. Falsehood is going to no longer be a shelter for individuals. And I believe in going back to these so-called modern-day prophets and these individuals who tickle the ear, their speech is rooted in lies. And that's why we have this very strong word, as it appears here, kazav, in referring to lies, deceit, that which is false. And their hiding place, it is going to be destroyed. How? Water will sweep it away. It will be destroyed. And the word here that is used is where we get the word in Hebrew, shitaphon, which is a flood that comes about quickly, that brings destruction in a very fast manner. Verse 18. Now, we've seen that there's been a covenant, there's been a contract with death and Sheol, meaning simply that the people have agreed with that which they should not. And what's going to happen? Well, notice what he says, verse 18. That covenant, he says here literally, your covenant your covenant with death is going to be atoned for. Some Bibles will use the word annulled. It is an annulment, but it's the word atoned for. And your contract with Sheol, the place of dead, this agreement will not stand. And it's going to be destroyed. Meaning most scholars 
Israel is going to come to a right understanding because of judgment. They're going to see the one, and I believe it's speaking in regard to the Antichrist, this covenant with death and Sheol. And by the way, if you look sometime in Revelation chapter 6, those seal judgments, if you look at the fourth seal and you find that, that fourth horseman that's on that unusual horse, if you do a good study, the color of that horse is green, not spotted, not, not dappled, but rather green is the proper word. And green is associated with pain and intense suffering. And this fourth horseman, which really is a composite of the first three, it says that he comes forth and death and Sheol follow after him. So death and Sheol relates to Satan, which relates to Satan incarnate or the Antichrist. So we read here that your covenant with death will be atoned for and your agreement with Sheol, the place of the dead, will not stand. Why? Because the shot, the whip, some will say scourge, it's a, a punishment. A punishment will, will swiftly pass. And it says, for it will pass and there will be by it, this punishment, a trampling. And this is simply a word for when things are trampled, they're destroyed. They're left in ruin. They're left in, in utter destruction. This is what's going to happen to those that, that have made that agreement, those that have participated in the things of the Antichrist. They are going to be trampled down. Verse 19. Still speaking about the judgment. For each time it passes, it will take you. For in the morning, in morning it will pass, in the day and in night, and it will be only, and we have a word, for terror. All of this is going to bring about an utter terror, great fear. That fear which is astonishing and paralyzing. All of this judgment is going to go way beyond what the children of Israel ever thought. And it's reminiscent to the shock that they had when they saw Jerusalem, the walls being burst through, the city and the temple set upon fire, and the destruction that came. This is the reference now, this is not the utter fulfillment of that. The fulfillment will be in the last days. Verse 19 again. This is going to happen both day and night. It shall be only terror. And then he says, Hey, Veen, you will understand the report. You will understand, and the word for report here is the word shmuah, which is a word for hearing. You'll understand the report, what is heard. And many rightly understand that this word is used relating to hearing. Why? Because of what we read by the Apostle Paul, that faith comes to hearing. What God is doing here to his land, to his people, is a way to bring about faith the only way for the people to be brought to repentance and receive the report, the message of God. Verse 20. Now, there's going to be an initial resistance. When God calls us to repent, more often than not, we're slow to do so. And therefore, he's going to be speaking, and he gives an example. Look at verse 20. For, for short, is the bed from stretching out. And the, the covering is narrow to be, to be wrapped up, to curl up into. So we have a bed that, that is not comfortable, and we have a covering 
that really does not do what it should. And what he's speaking about here is all the promises, all that that the false prophet said, they don't materialize. They are, are far removed from reality. They're pale in comparison to the, the truth of, of what is happening. What they said simply does not measure up. Verse 21. Now, in verse 21, we see two events. Now, we know that David, David went to war, and you can read about this in First, First Chronicles chapter 14 and verse 16. I want to say that again. First Chronicles chapter, chapter 14 and verse 16. It's recorded earlier on as well, but David, David went to war with the Philistines and he chased them from this location. What it says here, let's read it. For as Mount Peretzim. Now, this is a location, it's mentioned in the scripture, Baal Peretzim, where David brought judgment. And if you look at that scripture from 1 Chronicles 14, you're going to see that he chased them all the way to Gibeah. It says as well, all the verse, for as the mountain of Peratzim, the Lord will stand, and as the valley of Gibeon, he will be angry. Now, some say that this, and in that passage I shared with you from First Chronicles, it speaks of this this judgment of God upon the Philistines and how they were chased all the way to, to Gibeon. But there's also another interpretation. If you look at Joshua 10, you'll see the implication of that event at this same location. But what do we read? Look carefully. For like Mount Pratsim, the Lord will stand. In the valley, like the valley of Gibon, he will be angry to do his deed. A foreign or a strange deed, meaning this. Normally, God moves to judge the enemy. He gives victory to his people and he judges the enemy. But some see this, this, this strange action is that God's bringing judgment upon his own people. Likewise, we see to work his work. And then we have a, another odd word. <laughs> Excuse me. The word that usually reflects one who is not a descendant of Jacob. Nuhriya. It's something that is foreign, not of God. And most of the rabbinical scholars see this relating to God behaving not as we would expect. He's behaving in a strange way, in a foreign way, in a way that, that is not for the people of God. Why? He's bringing judgment upon them. Verse 22. He does this as a way of manifesting his righteousness, his justice, and bringing about a change in order that, that truly his standards will be met by those who survive. Verse 22. And now, and this is a word of urgency, and now do not scoff, do not mock, lest your bands will be stronger. And this speaks about bands or, or courts. Some say it has to do with, with exile. Others say it has to do with bonds of punishment. However you see this, it is not something good. And God is saying, do not scoff at this. Do not, not speak about it in an incorrect manner. Don't mock these things. Because if you do, the bonds of punishment, these bands are going to be stronger. For, and the next word is the word chala, which means to bring something to an end. And the word after that is 
something that has been determined. So God will bring about an end, and this end is an end to a new beginning. God has determined an end of Israel's disobedience, of Israel not walking according to true prophetic revelation. God is going to bring an end to his people believing, deceiving, lying, false words. He says, I have heard, last part of verse 20, 22, I have heard from the Lord God of hosts concerning all of the land. Now, this could be all the land of Israel or all the earth. I tend to believe that it's emphasizing the changes in the land of Israel. But those changes in the land of Israel will have a, an impact, a transforming effect upon all of God's creation. So as God moves against Israel in order to bring about a change, a transformation, a repentance, and thereby instilling ultimately faith in his people, there is going to be a change all over the world. Verse 23. Now, verse 23, in, in many ways, is the most important verse next to verse 16. Verse 16 speaks about Messiah being established in Zion. But notice what it says in verse 23. Hear and hear my voice. Now, it's two different words. Let's read it in Hebrew. Hazinu ve shim'u. Most of you know the word shema. And the first word, what's, what's written here, hazinu, is a word that means listen but it comes from the word ear. So listen and hear. And then we have a third word for hearing and listening. The whole verse. Listen and hear my voice. And then the third word, listen, and back to the word Shema, and hear my speech or my word or my saying. So God is telling the people, Give ear to, listen to, hear, and all of this demands a response. God wants the people's attention. He wants them to recognize, to understand these words, and then ultimately, he wants them to respond properly. And if they do, well, we're going to see the outcome. They're going to be laborers for justice and righteousness. They are going to do the work properly. And the reason why I say this is what we read in the end of our study today. Look at verse 24. Hakol. Hakol is everything. And it speaks about a duration. So there's a question here. Throughout the duration of the day, the plower plows in order to to sow, he, he opens, meaning he opens the land. It's a expression for tilling, breaking up the soil. And then we have the word for breaking up clogs of dirt from the soil. He says, is that what he does? Does he do the same thing in order to plant? Does he just keep plowing and plowing and breaking up the, the clogs of dirt? Is that all he does? In order to sow? No, there's more to it. And what it's speaking about here is that we have to have a complete faith. Not just a faith that, that emphasizes one or two things. Those things that we like. Those things that, that we may be good at. Those things that come natural to us. Those things that are convenient. We can't do the same thing all the time. In the same way, the same activity done over and over won't produce any harvest. Verse 25. Surely, if, and the word here is equal, and it speaks about the surface of the land being flat. Once the land is prepared, once it's been leveled out, what do you do? They feed Kesach. You begin to plant, you begin to sow your seed. 
And the first word is just that for sowing seed, for scattering it of about. And then we have the word ketzach, which is an unusual word, only appears in this passage. And it's a word for a type of seed. Most scholars believe that all of these seeds are very small, but they produce a very desirable crop. And this is the seed for cumin. And there's two types. There's black cumin. This would be the word ketzach. And the word kamon, which is the regular form. And then we have another synonym for the word to scatter. This is the word to throw. So you throw these little seeds in the flat soil. Then it says, and there wheat in row. And barley is, is marked out and spelt another type of seed is its border. So there's a way when you have the land based upon a set of criteria for a specific outcome, there was a, a methodology to planting that you would, would break up the soil, plow it, flatten it, and then you would begin to cast your seeds, planting them in a certain location, not mixing your fields, but doing so in a very specific manner in order that the harvest would have the greatest potential. Verse, verse 26, he says, and, and he will discipline him for justice. His God will teach him. Now, some point out there's just that there's this discipline first and then the teaching. And I believe this is another very important verse. What we saw earlier on in verse 23, verse 16, and now verse 26, three verses that are really vital. What he's saying here is, first, I am going to discipline my people, and then I will teach him. Verse 27. For not with, and this is an instrument for, for plowing. He says, for not with such an instrument does he thresh this, this black cumin. And, and not with the will of a cart upon the, the cumin does he turn. Rather, he says, with a, a staff, he beats the black cumin, and the regular cumin he does with a rod. So there are specific tools. There is a methodology of not only planning, but now we're dealing with the harvest. So the harvest only comes about when you use the right means. And what this is telling us is what God is doing, how he's behaving in the last days. He understands how to plant. He knows what to plant, where to plant it, and also how to harvest in order that the outcome, the harvest, produces the greatest results. That's what Isaiah is telling us about God's activity in the last days. Verse 28, another example of God knowing what to do and what not to do. He says bread, and this would be the grain that is, is used to, made, to make bread. It says bread is, is grind down. The grain is, is grind down into powder, but, but you don't do so. You don't thresh it forever so there's an activity that you do it's the right activity but you don't do it too long it is not something you do over and over and over it comes a point in time where it's enough that activity that process reaches its end 
And then he says, with the will of the cart, his cart, he, he does not break. And with the hoofs, and this would be the hooves of his horses, or it could be with the, the cavalry, meaning the, the uh, horsemen, he does not grind. So you want to grind up these things, but you don't use the will of a cart. You don't use the hooves of horses or the cavalry to, to tread upon these things. That would not produce the right results. Verse 29, our last verse. Also this, meaning all these things are with the Lord of hosts meaning he knows what to do. These things that are going to happen in the last days, they come as an outcome of God activity, of, of the work of Messiah in the last days to produce a righteous and a just kingdom. Once more, verse 29, all of this is from the Lord of hosts. It goes forth, his counsel goes forth marvelously or wonderfully. And his resource is great. Literally, it simply says counsel, but it's his counsel. It simply says resource, it's his resource is great. So he speaks about how the counsel of God and the provision of God are wonderful and magnificent. God is going to bring about the change among his people that needs to be done. He understands the situation. He knows how the methodology, what to do in order to produce God-pleasing results. What is our response to all of this? To submit. To believe in Messiah and to be part of his objectives, serving him in order that righteousness and justice might be manifested. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.